All right, there we go. It looks like we do have things sorted. Let me, before we do any introductions, Lindsay, Perry, are you with us? I hope so. Can everybody uh, let us know if you can hear me <laughs> and see me? We should be able to hear and see you. Let us know in the comments. If, uh, if you do, please, uh, it would be hugely appreciated. And then Nikki de Villiers, can you hear and see Nikki de Villiers? Nice to have you on as well, Nikki. Yes, awesome to be here. I hope everyone can see. Well, as long as they can hear, I think that's the most important. Seeing yeah, absolutely. All right. So we've got the comments open. Let me just ask once again. Uh, I see a whole bunch of people have jumped on. Obviously, we've had to change the link. Please let us know if you can see and hear. Yes. Lindsay, uh, it looks like all is good. So we've managed to flick it over. Everything seems to be working. Can see and hear the coach. Woohoo! We are winning, which is fantabulous. <laughs> Uh, man alive, that was uh, stressful to say the least. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, just give you a little bit of uh, a background this evening as to what we're going to do, who we are, and all of that sort of thing. It looks like everybody is on. Tina saying all good now. Uh, Bayer O'Brien and Schlantla Jele, fabulous. Everybody is on. All right, I need to ask everybody who is on this live stream a massive, massive favor. Uh, Obviously, what's gone and happened is we have lost the original live stream feed. So there are a lot of people who would have been joining us on this live call, but uh, unfortunately aren't joining us because uh, we've changed the link. So if you wouldn't mind, please, in the, the Facebook groups and the WhatsApp groups and, and all the running groups that you're in, if you wouldn't mind just... Uh, sharing this this link uh, just hit the share button and that'll get it out to as many people as possible uh, and then we can get that info out as uh, best we can also if you wouldn't mind letting us know in the comments what number comrades you are training for so if you are training for your first comrades or if you're training for your 10th comrades your 20 comrades we want to know all about that okay so that's exactly what we are going to be doing so coming up in tonight's webinar we are going to be talking about what you should be doing right now, uh, looking at what you need to be focusing on for the next four weeks, uh, the last chance to chase seeding, when that last chance is, uh, as well as uh, just talking about how much training is still to come and why you don't want to uh, be going full out right now. And then we're also going to be planning your comrades nutrition strategy. And that's essentially what this live stream is all about. We're going to be trying to help you as much as possible, put a plan together tonight that you can try in your long runs, your marathons, your ultra marathons, so that come comrades race day, you you are uh, rearing to go as far as your nutrition strategy is concerned. So a massive welcome to everybody who has joined us. I see we do have uh, a lot of people on the stream, which is great. Apologies once again about the false start tonight and the... Uh, the load, or it wasn't even load shedding, it was a, a power, a substation that exploded last night, but uh, we are up and running, which is great news. Uh, as always, comments and questions are welcome, so please do pop them into the uh, comments below the video, and we'll get to as many of those as we can tonight. Who are we? First of all, we've got uh, Lindsay Parry, who is the Comrades coach, the official Comrades Marathon coach. He's coached winners, as well as thousands of uh, everyday weekend warriors through to Comrades success. Uh, he's also been to two Olympic Games and two Commonwealth Games, and he's a pretty speedy runner himself. He's got a marathon PB of 2.45. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Brad Brown. I am not uh, a two-hour 45 marathoner. Uh, I've been around Comrades my entire life. My dad's run 11. I ran my first one back in 2010. My brother's run a whole bunch, and I'm going back for number four. Uh, hopefully, if all goes according to plan in 2020, I started the Race for Charity initiative, which has raised over 40 million rand for the official Comrades charities. And also on the call tonight, we've got Nikki de Villiers. Uh, Nikki's sort of resume speaks for itself. She graduated as a dietitian at the University of Pretoria. She's got a postgraduate diploma uh, through the International Olympic Committee and has a uh, master's degree in dietetics. She's uh, also got over 20 years experience and is currently in private practice. And she consults to various PSL teams, pro rugby teams, as well as the Comrades Marathon Association. So that's who your team is tonight. Before we get into tonight's uh, sort of uh sort of presentation i just wanted to share a quick story uh and the guy on the left you might recognize he's the late jackie meckler the guy on the right is a guy by the name of jeffrey abrams i love comrade stories and jeffrey's story is fantastic uh jeffrey is a pretty decent runner in his own right he, he runs for the clarkstorp marathon club and uh he sort of 
has been running for a few years. He's currently 47 years old. And uh, last year at Johnson Crane, which was about this time, it's just after Johnson Crane now, he ran a marathon PB of 3.08, and he went on to run his back-to-back -back comrades in 8.25. And, uh, yeah, he has got a phenomenal, phenomenal story. Just over a year ago, he made a choice that had a major impact on his running. And I'm going to share what that choice was a little bit later on. So you're going to need to stick around for that. Lindsay, let's get straight into tonight's presentation and looking at where we should be right about now from a training perspective. Yeah, so there's a lot of people who've just uh, recently qualified. Um, uh, tons of races up in, in Gauteng. Johnson Crane, um, uh, we just had the JP Marathon, um, there was Acacia in Pretoria, and there's a couple that are literally just on the on our doorstep, and uh, in Natal there was a big qualifying effort at Hillcrest Marathon, so really there are a lot of people that have qualified, and they should be recovering and allowing themselves, their body to recover from that effort. And then there's a whole lot of people that are about to qualify. Um, and, you know, anybody who is looking to really push a marathon and to, to get a good seating, this is really um, when you should be doing that. And, and there's a little bit more about that in a couple of slides time. But that's kind of the two groups of people we have. And those that are about to qualify are probably in uh, sort of mini, mini peak training phase and I think the important thing to understand about where we are now is that we are actually still in the kind of preparation phase for our peak training which is to come in the middle of March running in, into April so that's why if you've just qualified from a marathon where you are now is you're licking your wounds making sure everything your body repairs itself recovers properly from that effort and then you'll get going and building up slowly or you're about to qualify in which case you will follow that exact same process which is that you're about to go into a little bit of a recovery phase and that's important because we still have plenty of time remember comrades has moved later in the year to the 14th of june and so it does afford us an opportunity to race really hard up until about the first week of March um, and then beyond that we don't want to be racing any marathons um, so yeah that in a nutshell is kind of where we are we're, we're, we're gathering our strength if you like for um, the main training which is to come in in March and, and April. All right let's talk about the next four weeks uh, and we normally talk about it from a medal perspective but what should we be focusing on over the next four weeks for the finishes the guys and girls who are going for between 11 and 12 hours? Yeah, so again, we, we split that up into people who have qualified and, and people who still need to qualify. And on the finishes program, for the people who have qualified, if it's very recently, as I said, they'll be doing a rest period. And then over a two-week period, they will ease back into training. So typically, you'll take a week off. Then you'll probably do between 20 and 25 kilometers in total in your first week back. And then you'd build up to about 40 Ks. And by the end of this four-week block, you want to be somewhere between 45 and 55 kilometers a week. And obviously, if you are looking to qualify or about to qualify, you will then go into that same pattern, but you will be delayed by one to two to three weeks. Um, so yeah, that that's basically the finishes. Then we move on to the bronze medal. Uh, those are the guys that are aiming for sub-11 hours. And the same principle will apply. You will start also after about a week off, you'll start with between 25 and 30 kilometers and you'll build up on that to get to between 60 and 65 kilometers by the end of um, February. Uh, if you're about to qualify, you'll do that qualifying, you'll take a week off and again, you would just be a week behind. And um, look, I know there'll be people out there that'll be panicking when I talk about being a week behind, but you'll only be a week behind until you get your first recovery week in the program. So essentially, after four weeks, um, so again, in March, when it's the most important time of training, you will then catch up and then everybody will be on the same, uh, will be on the same program. So don't, uh, don't get too, too worried about that. Also, if you haven't added strength training yet, so I didn't speak about that with the finishes, but the finishes really should have been on strength training right from the beginning. But we also want to start building some strength now on the bronze medal program, really preparing the body or starting to prepare the body for all the big miles of training, but also for the eccentric load 
at Comrades. Then we move into the Robert Machali. So those are the guys that are not quite good enough for sub nine, but they still a very swift sub-10 hour, and, and this will put you in the top 50% of the field. So, again, I often say to people, if you can't judge time very well, then have a look at the results at the end of the races that you run. And if you're finishing in the top 50%, that probably gives you a clue that this is the, the, the right medal for you. Um, if you've just qualified, same as the other medals, you are going to be having a rest. You will again, I always like to start that first week very light just to make sure that there's no lingering pain or injury. So again, you're going to be in the in the 25 to maximum 35 kilometer range and you're going to build up until the end of February. You want to be close to 70 kilometers. So probably 65 to maximum 75 kilometers and um you definitely need to be adding some strength training and probably just before the end of February, probably or certainly by early March, you'll start adding some strength training in the form of, of hills. And again, if you are about to qualify, you'll just delay that whole process by a week or, or straight after your, your marathon. Um, if it's in March, you'll take a week off and then just that first easy week and then you'll get back into the program. Um, Bill Rowe, now we're getting into the real racing stakes now. We're talking about the top 25% of the field. So, you know, that that really does tell you that we, we're talking about some, some faster runners. Um, again, after your rest week, and a much lighter week, somewhere between 40 and 50 kilometers. So that's obviously more than the other medals, but it's still a fairly light week. And then over the course of February into the first week of March, you'll be looking to build up to scratching on about 80k, so between 75 and 80 kilometers. And I'm sure people are getting tired of this joke, but, you know, this is just one of those jokes which is is funny because it's true. Um, the top 5% of the field, or as I like to say, the people who are tired of their friends and family that are training for a seven and a half hour um, will most – most should have qualified by this stage, but you also still have until March to do it. So you may still be looking to qualify and you'll come out of that little week off and run between 50 and 70 Ks. It'll depend a bit on, on the program that you're following before and it'll depend a bit just how sore you were after running your sub three hour marathon. Um, so between 50 and 70 Ks and you'll build that up so that by the end of February or the first week of March, you are hovering somewhere between 100 and 120 Ks. And again, that'll depend on whether you start at 50, 70 and the training that you were doing before. And we'll be doing speed work and some some hill work uh, pretty much from the, the end of February. So that kind of gives you an idea of everybody um, and what they should be doing in the next four weeks. All right. Fabulous. Uh, don't forget, as always, two questions are always welcome. We love having them. So feel free to pop them into the comments. I see we've got people from all around the world joining us. If you have just joined us, welcome. Uh, apologies once again for the change in live stream address. We did have one or two small technical issues at the start of this broadcast, but everything seems to be perfect now. Uh, keep those questions coming in the comments. We'll get to some of those now. Just so that you are aware, we are trying to really rush through Lindsay's stuff because we want to get to Nikki. Uh, and talk nutrition because it's really important to get that sorted now. Lindsay, and then just finally for you, uh, you were talking to me a little bit earlier today about uh, seedings and why it's important not to to chase seeding too close to comrades. And you reckon end of the month, end of February is the date for chasing seedings. Yeah, so look, I do relax that a little bit now because it's the 14th of February. But ideally, we want it done by the end of February and the reason why we want it done by the end of February not qualifying but but really your last hard effort for for racing is because if we do that as I spoke about in terms of where we should be right now the end of Feb allows a week of recovery a week of easing your way back into it and then we are in the middle of March which takes us into our peak training months for comrades. And the reason why we don't want to be chasing seeding or racing in that period, 17 March until uh, kind of the middle of May, is because if we run a very hard marathon, that's going to compromise our training time. And, and typically, there's very few people that are going to improve 
more than one seeding batch. So if you are chasing seeding at best, absolute best, you, you are looking at saving yourself two minutes on race day. And that two minutes that you save on race day, I firmly believe is going to cost you more from the training that you're going to miss or worst case scenario, the injury that you may pick up. So I'm going to emphasize the following stat again and again and again over the next four webinars. And that is that 68% of the people who do not finish comrades do so because they started with an injury. That's not something that we sucked out of thin air or that we think um, that is real statistics from surveys that we do every single year with runners and it gets more and more powerful each time that we add the stats in there. But 68% of people who don't finish comrades, they start with an injury. Now, if we're going to race a marathon in March and then try to carry on with our peak training, that's a pretty high risk for injury. And that injury is going to cost you a lot more than two minutes on race day. And the fatigue, training with fatigue if you don't get injured, but even just training with that fatigue, you're not going to be able to train effectively. It's going to compromise your training. It's going to cost you more than two minutes on race day. So sure, by all means, we may not all be in a position to qualify yet, and we may need to qualify into March and into April. But the later you qualify, the lower your relative effort of qualifying should be where possible so we'll as this process unfolds we will obviously talk to novices people new to running people who really have to run their guts out to run a 450 and we'll put some strategies in place to combat combat those but that is probably in the region of one one and a half thousand people for the vast majority of the field you are capable of what running the qualifying times at a much lower effort than your best and if you don't qualify before the end of february or if you qualify but you aren't happy with your seating I, I implore you that any marathons and ultras you run you run them well within yourself so that you avoid injury and you avoid being too tired um, and there is obviously the option of getting into the charity batch there, I can't remember the exact number, but there's a limited number of people that can raise money for a very good cause, and you can start in C batch, and that will save you heaps of time, and it will allow you to train um, without pushing yourself too hard. But th the most important message from this slide is that you really want to save the training time, middle of March, to um, taper time to prepare yourself as well as you can for comrades and racing marathons during that time is not making best use of that time. Absolutely. Lindsay, a question from Tabocha, and it's, it's on that, and he's talking about the seeding batches going from an F to a D seeding. Obviously, in between that's E, which is the green number club. So that jump is going to be slightly bigger than two minutes, but you're not going to make yourself 10 minutes by doing that jump. So the same principle applies, uh, I'm guessing. Yeah, and it's actually not going to be two minutes because there's the way that it works. If, I mean, obviously, if you're an A seeding, you lose between naught and ten seconds to get over the line, depending on how far back you are. If you're in B, if you're in B, you lose less than forty-five seconds. If you if you're in um, C, it takes you about a minute to a minute and a half to get across. So you can see that as you move further back the relative time that you lose gets more and more and more. And the biggest jumps are, are at the back. So between G uh, between um, G and H is probably about two minutes. F and G is about a minute and a half. Between F and D is probably about a minute. So you're probably going to save yourself two and a half, maximum three minutes. And so exactly the same principle applies. And Lindsay, you also mentioned that even though we are – midway through February now, and comrades, if you look on the calendar, it doesn't seem that far away. You spoke about the peak training coming in April and May, or, or March and March and April, so that, that those sort of two months. We see lots of guys and girls smashing huge mileage now, and it's easy to get carried away, but it's also easy to get burnt out six weeks, eight weeks before comrades. You, you've got to be wary. Even though it doesn't seem that long, there is still a long way to go in training. No, there, there is, and I keep emphasizing this March um, 
until May period because elite athletes only go into peak training for 10 to 12 weeks. So, you know, if the best of the best with the best biomechanics, with the lowest physical mass, um, the most recovery time, if they are only going into peak training and can only handle, and, and I mean, the reason they would train hard for longer if they could, but the reason why they only go that eight to 10 weeks is because after that, you start to get stale, you start to risk injury, um, you start to lose motivation. So that is the reason. And this period, sure, we are training and it is important to be doing some training. But this part of the training is either getting ready for your qualifier and then giving yourself a physical and mental break or it's part of the gently building up and laying the foundation to prepare your body for the peak training. Absolutely. Fahima just uh, posted saying she agrees on the charity seedings. Uh, if uh, if anything, it's my personal view that every comrade's runner should run for his charity. Fahima, I agree with you at least once. She's run for CHOP for the last two years as cancer is a, uh, a personal cause in the family. It's rewarding running for a charity. Pretty easy. Comrades Marathon Association wants us to raise 6,000 Rand by the end of April. We all know at least 60 people, 100 Rand from each, and you are sorted. So, Fima, I love that. And I am also a huge fan of the C seeding batch. And I think there's only 500 spots. So uh, if you're going to do it, you've got to move fast, okay? Uh, Lindsay, before we get into, or and Nikki, before we get into the nutrition stuff, let's just deal with one or two questions that have come through. Uh, one has got to do, let me add this. It's from Paul. Paul is saying, what's the best way to keep your feet dry and prevent blisters uh, and lost toenails? I've just lost two big nails at the Johnson Crane. Paul, welcome to ultra marathon running. You're now part of the club. That's a badge of honor that. So the most important thing in terms of, of, of keeping your, your toenails um, healthy is to really cut them quite short. Uh, so anytime you're going to, 50 k seems to be the kind of magic number. So anytime you're going to be running anywhere near 30 k's or longer, make sure that your your toenails are cut really short. And um, I would also put a nail file to them so that there's no edges that can catch on either your sock or your shoe. If you still are catching um, the top of your shoe. You can actually cut them. I know. I know that's painful because you've paid three and a half grand. Uh, I think the going price is for for these high mileage shoes these days. But you can actually cut them to stop the the the, the you from catching on the top of the shoe because that's what it is. It's actually very seldom when you're banging into the front. So that does happen. Obviously, if you haven't sized the shoes right, your, your toes can ram into the front of the shoe, but it's not typically that. It's actually that, that nail repeatedly catching on the sock or the top of the shoe. Um, in terms of keeping your, your feet dry, that is slightly more difficult. Um, and to avoid that, you really need to be careful in terms of the quantities of fluid that you are spraying onto yourself. But even with that, your feet will get a bit wet because you're sweating into them. And if it's a particularly hot day, you, you're going to sweat into them. So again, depending on where those blisters are, um, you can use things like Vaseline. You can use things like um, Elastoplast, and that's that, that white sticky um, tape that we, if, if, if Paul's a South African, I hope so, um, the, what we used to race on the track with and cross country with when we were kids. That like um, strapping that you see on the rugby players. If you use that type of strapping to strap over that area and then Vaseline over the top of that, that'll often be a really good way of alleviating blisters. All right, cool question. Uh, staying with foot uh, with feet, one from Aubrey. Aubrey wants to know uh, about shoe selection. Is it possible to swap around shoe brands or should you stay loyal? Uh, as in have different shoe brands for different workouts, long tempo runs, races, etc.? So I want to add one more thing. You can also for the blister okay. question, you can get double. You can get double layered socks so that the friction is between the socks, the two layers of socks, rather than between your foot and the shoe. Um, yeah, you can in in South Africa, the one brand that I know is is Randewear. So you can jump on and and look for Randewear, um, Google it, and, and and you'll find you you'll be able to get those double layered socks. In terms of shoes. Um, 
I don't know too many people who flick between brands, and I think that would be complicated because the molds are different. Um, and so I would imagine that that changing mold may cause you some issues. But certainly, I am um, yeah, I'm quite a fan of, of running in slightly different models of the same brand um, to change things up slightly. Uh, and that I have found personally and with with, uh, with people that I've worked with that that can work quite well. And interestingly, I don't know the results, but I am currently involved in a study where that is one of the things that they are looking at. Um, and so what they have done is identified potentially a one of the, the potential things for um, for injury is always running in exactly the same shoe. So you know, that's, those uh, results should be out in the next three to six months. So hopefully before the end of the webinar series, I will get permission to share those those results with you and I'll be able to give you a, a better answer that's actually been tested um, with some academic research. Uh, Nikki, I know you're holding on patiently, but yes, we've actually had a few of these questions, Lindsay, and, and I'm going to batch them together because they're all sort of similar. Uh, one is from... Paula Collins, who is in Texas. Uh, Paula says, uh, at the moment, uh, or the moment I up my mileage, I often catch a cold or pick up the flu. How do I avoid this? And then Jonathan Nell, uh, and he's not the only one who's asked this sort of question. He says, I've just had bronchitis for three weeks, uh, which has thrown my training off completely. Is it too late to get back into training? Let's talk about keep your immune system up as you're increasing training and also losing some training because of illness. Uh, I mean, three weeks off, is his comrades blown? Okay, so let me start with question one first. And, and I think if you haven't listened to the first webinar, then I would encourage you to download that and listen to the first webinar because in there I really do, uh, I recall talking in quite a bit of detail about the fact that to finish comrades, we don't need to crush out massive mileage. And it's much more important to do lower mileage in the region of 40 to 50 kilometers a week um, or in, in, in miles that's that's probably 20 to to 30 miles per week um, and do that consistently week after week after week than it is to do too big too big a mileage and get sick or get injured uh, because that's actually when you're going to be at biggest risk to to not finishing comrades so I think what you need to do is keep, fairly fairly low or on the lower end of the recommended mileages that we talk about as we go through these webinars. And then you'll obviously have that odd bigger week where there's a long run, a marathon or a long training run. And the important thing then for you, because you, you are susceptible to getting um, sick, is then after that week to, to make sure that you have a recovery week and take it much easier uh, so that you can look after yourself. And then crucially, that is one of the reasons why we've chosen to do the nutrition talk so early in the cycle of webinars, because I believe that the nutrition, and if you eat well, can go a long way to helping sort out recovery, immune system, uh, and, and so on. And then in terms of having missed three weeks, it's absolutely not terminal. Um, I don't know when you came on to the webinar, but as I pointed out in the where are we now, the where are we now phase is not training very hard for comrades. We're in the building up phase and getting ready to train for comrades. So no, it is not terminal. What would be terminal is if you threw yourself into too hard training, built up too quickly, threw yourself straight back onto one of the comrades programs and then got a secondary infection or reinfection of, of the same thing. So what I would encourage you to do is to really just build up slowly over the next four weeks. And as long as you get back to training at reasonably full steam by the end of that four weeks, you're absolutely still on track for comrades. Lindsay, you are such a pro. Uh, I love the segue into the nutrition because that's what we are talking about next. Uh, and it's time to bring Nikki in. And uh, yeah, let me not flick through all the slides. Nikki de Villiers, you've been waiting patiently for us. Thank you very much uh, for, for your patience as we, we ran through that. 
And uh, I know that you wanted to run through a few things tonight with regards to, to nutrition and particularly how it ties into to comrades and uh, what, we, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing in training so that we can execute it properly on race day. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, I'm probably going to just swing it around a bit and start with the staying healthy just to connect with the previous question we had on and that to properly deal with a lot of the other things as well so the first thing in terms of staying healthy and stuff that we need to really concentrate on now is to eat enough food um, often the first line for the immune system in terms of nutrition is or the connection point for a lot of people is usually what supplements to take and then they talk about the micronutrients where I think the first point of connection should be, am I eating enough? So as soon as we go into a deficit, so the energy balance is all crooked, start running more, start eating less due to tiredness, whatever the reason, then you're going to run into a deficit and that's going to impact the immune system quite a lot. So that's point number one is eat enough. Try not to manipulate too hard to manipulate weight. I still get people that want to still lose a lot of weight before they go into the running there will be some weight loss properly with the loads of training that's coming in March, but I think um, don't manipulate too much to try and get the weight under a certain number. The second thing is the whole thing about carbohydrate intake at this stage is quite important. Not only it's one, you know, one aspect how we're going to try and get the immune system not to react too well they're on us. So the carbs must be enough intake or the intake must be enough. And the other thing is, I think you've mentioned it quite a few times, Brad, is we need to train with stuff that we're going to run on, on comrades, and now is the time to train it when the intensity is not maybe that high and so forth. Um, so we need to train on fuel every training set. We also need to understand that it's one thing about training the body, but the gut needs training for what it's going to take and what it's going to do on that day. So I want us to really be diligent in trying to feel your running, you know, all your runs with – you know, appropriate fuel sources that's easy to to take and that you experiment with a few things, um, keeping in mind that it's going to be a really long day and eating the same thing over and over and over again can be quite monotonous. So you really have to be comfortable with that. So um, not only then fueling the race, but also try to always eat something before you go on to the run. Get a lot of people that fuel the they races, but they don't feel their trainings. And we get better in training sets. And again, you need to teach the body to be used to what you're going to do, um, what you're going to run with on cameras. Obviously, it will be easier on races. We're up earlier than what you just go for a training run, but a little bit can, de can definitely take you a really far away. And these fuel sources are usually a carbohydrate based thing. So, a starchy thing, or fruit, or half a banana, or, or you know, juice, or whatever. Get used to something. That's easy, you know, to take in and easy to carry around. The other important thing I want to discuss quickly is just the recovery. So really make sure we recover well afterwards. Um, I mean, the one thing that I want people to understand is recovery is not all about whatever I take just after. Recovery starts in your run. So even if you have a nice, you know, slow recovery run, to understand that maybe, you know, tomorrow morning there's a very hard one coming up. And if you're going to even in the recovery run go too deep in your stores, the recovery time is going to be a problem. So recovery starts within the um, run that we're doing. And then afterwards, make sure, first of all, carbohydrate recovery. Second of all, a liquid for rehydration. Third is the protein intake. And try to take it relatively soon after your run, as soon as you're comfortable um, to eat and drink again. Um, and then the other quality stuff that needs to be there, especially then for the immune system, is fruit and vegetable intake. Um, to really up on those things. It does make a difference if we do it with consistency. It doesn't help we do it a day before and think, there we go. So I need a consistent intake of fruit and veggies with most of the meals that you eat every day. That would equate to about five portions of the stuff. And to include a variety um, of different fruits and different vegetables because through that we build a nice and strong immune system. And the last thing I really want to just hammer on um, before we take questions is maybe um, the hydration bit. So make sure that we fully hydrate it with other words and um, drink enough liquids throughout the day. I often find people drink quite a lot of liquids in and around training 
but coming through the rest of the day, it's quite skimpy. So it's important that we do take fluids throughout, throughout the day, but then also whilst you're training, work on your strategy to take fluids in the run. Not overdoing it, drink maybe according to thirst, um, but make sure that we drink regular amounts, small amounts, um, starting quite early in the run so that we don't run out of it. Because once you're dehydrated, it's really difficult to absorb stuff from the stomach. So you're really going to struggle from there onwards. Nikki, we've, we've got a, a couple of questions in and, and we'll touch on them. But, but the first thing you mentioned was eating enough food. Uh, and Robin uh, was, was asking, can, can you comment on how much carbohydrate and how much protein an average person 68 to 70 kgs would need for comrades as well as the days leading up to comrades obviously this is a long-term sort of thing and, and you mentioned the weight loss and you should lose some weight but that shouldn't be your primary focus how do you know that you are eating enough food and what should you be what sort of food should you be eating in training to make sure that you have a good comrades all right usually um uh, the clear tell symptom of eating enough food is your weight is balanced. So if you lose weight, you're eating too little. If you gain weight, you're eating too much for what you're doing. That's, you know, very su simplistic and it gives us a good idea of where we're going. I do also, although see sometimes people that even pick up weight with eating too little food. So one must just be clear that, you know, that you make sure that is not occurring. Um, there is specific recommendations in grams, carbohydrate per kilogram body weight, which um, it's laid out. It's just difficult sometimes for people to relate grams, carbohydrate to food. Um, so it gets a bit complicated there. So I think the main thing there is to make sure carbohydrate is enough. So to make it simple, Brad, eat within an hour after waking up, every three hours thereafter. Make sure you include a carbohydrate source with every meal that you eat. So that can be, remember, if I talk carbohydrate source, I'm talking either a starchy thing, milk, yogurt, or fruit. So every meal that we have, including that, every meal that you have, try and include a protein. So a little bit of nuts, a little bit of peanut butter. But in most of your meals, your um, carbohydrate will actually be either the same or even a little bit more than the protein intake. So a lot of people putting a lot of emphasis on protein intake where we need to switch that around in terms of when we train hard or long um, hours. Um, and then she asked about the what should we be eating, and that is fuel food. So fuel food, again, carbohydrate containing things, so milk, yogurt, fruit, um, and then starches or grains. Um, usually when we go out for a run, we don't include very heavy stuff, so no, a lot of fiber stuff in that meal before we go and run because that can upset the stomach. But the rest of the day, we want quality carbs. So stuff that's as close as possible to nature, that we can find potatoes, sweet potatoes, whole grain um, stuff, whole wheat pastas, um, rice would be fine, whole wheat breads, those kind of things. And then just make sure on the meal before my run that we maybe eat a bit refined. So slice of white bread or cream cracker, um, those kind of things should be better before we run, if, especially if you've got a sensitive stomach. Yeah, Nikki. Let's talk about because again, it's one of those things that we've got to we've got to train our bodies in order to to eat before a run, so that come race day we don't try something new and 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 ruin our comrades because of that. Let's talk about sort of what you what you could be eating and what you should be eating, and then let's also touch on alternatives for, for maybe someone because of nerves or whatever it is can't really keep any solids down or or, or it affects their GI because they're eating solids. What are some of the ideal things to do or, or eat before you go and run and, and, and what sort of quantities and how long before? Alrighty. So um, the main thing there is it would be ideal if if we can eat something a little bit bigger two hours before, all right? And I think maybe it's not possible on training runs, but you know, in your races it could be possible, especially if you're traveling quite a distance. Eat something that's carbohydrate-based, so a bowl of oats usually works well for some people. Your favorite breakfast cereal works well with a bit of milk with that, or oats with honey and a banana. You can do fruit salad maybe with a yogurt mix. Um, and those, that's quite, um, even you know, slices of bread with peanut butter, banana, and honey usually works well. Um, we want to keep in this meal we want to try and not eat excessive amounts of fats because fats kind of stay in the stomach for a long time. So that's going to cause discomfort when you're running. 
So stay away from fried stuff and bacon and, you know, excessive amounts of butter and those kind of things. You can include a bit of protein, like a little bit of cheese on something, a little bit of peanut butter, especially if it's a long run, because some people do struggle with getting hungry on the run. And then the other very important thing of that meal, it should contain a, li it should contain a liquid. So either a mug of coffee, if you're used to coffee, otherwise a cup of tea, glass of orange juice, plain water, you can drink and rehydrate, any of those kind of things. Then um, if you've got that meal in two hours before, you can probably top up, you know, as you're at the start with a little bit of liquid. Some people will take a gel just before they start. So it's just basically a little bit of a carb top up in this meal please stay away from fat and protein. So if you need to eat something there, make it pure carbs because the carb will clear from the stomach within half an hour to an hour and you should be ready to run. Um, those of us that's a little bit you know, nervous before we run and it feels as if there's a brick in your stomach, I would definitely still prefer for you to have something. Otherwise, it's going to be a really, really long day. And that something can come through a liquid. So your favorite smoothie or you can make – um, pro-nitro and a lot of milk that it's in a liquid that you can just drink it um, you can put banana you know and a hand a spoon of peanut butter and yogurt in a smoothie drink that um, or make oats very you know sloggy that you can just drink it down if nothing of that works um, you can make use of a meal replacement so that it's just important that we don't drink protein shakes before we go and run so the meal replacement must be a carb predominant thing. So if they look at the back of the label, the carbs must be higher than the protein. You will usually find it in the line of the recovery drinks, um, not the protein drinks um, when you choose those. But you need to really, with these, you really need to try it out before race day. Um, these, the protein components in those things got a tendency for some people to work not that great. So you need to try that out. If nothing else works, you know, drink a big glass of apple juice and see if you can go on that. But um, really train your gut to accept the stuff that we're going to have on race day. Yeah, Nikki, it's interesting you talk about the, the two hours before. And, and Comrades is an interesting beast because uh, you, you mentioned it's difficult to do two hours before a training run. And on the Comrades down run, a lot of runners stay in Durban and travel through on the morning to, to the race day. So they up actually longer than two hours before race day. So you've got to factor that in as well, that there's a good chance you are going to be up for three, three and a half, four hours before the race actually starts. I remember my first comrades was a down run. I stayed at a hotel in Durban and the guys that were taking us to the start picked us up at uh, half past 12 for the 5.30 start. And, and that was something I didn't think of. So that's something to bear in mind as well uh, with regards to uh, with regards to that. And then, Nikki, as far as hydration on race day itself, uh, Comrades is a long day, particularly for the vast majority of the field where you're out there for between 10 and 12 hours. Uh, and it's you're taking your body further than you've ever been in training. So it's very difficult to know how your body's going to react 9, 10, 11, 12 hours into a Comrades what advice can you give to someone to limit the damage? What, what Should we be eating solids? Should we be smashing a gel in our face every 45 minutes? What's the, the right way to do it? Yes, so Red, we don't have a right way. Otherwise, we would have just given you the list. We might have to <laughs> but I think that is why we're training it now, so that we know what we tolerate. I think the best advice I can give is start early, do regular, small amounts. like And that... I can't stress enough the start early part of this thing because if we do it well and if we do, you know, regular eating through the front part of the race, when you get to that unfamiliar territory where your body starts complaining, you can actually relax, you know, a little bit on the eating or the drinking because you've been doing well and there is a bank that will sort it out. It's just that when we start late, there is a probability that you're going to have a very small window in which you're going to feel well to eat and drink in if you start too late. So start early, do regular stuff. With regular, I mean every 20 minutes, every half an hour, you can do it on a time or you can do it per water table. Just also keeping in mind that water tables at the comrades a little bit closer than what it would be in your normal run. So sometimes it does help to rather check the watch. So every 20 minutes, take a carbohydrate containing thing in a smaller amount and get used to that. Um, in your training, then obviously um, you want to train with stuff that is going to be on the comrades' tables. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard to get to all the stuff that you need throughout the day. And sometimes we tend to be a little bit fussy 
in terms of what we're having. And that can actually put us on the back foot. So train with whatever is going to be on the tables. And that is what is on normal tables, you know, when we do our marathons. So the potatoes will be there and those kind of things. Should it be solids? Should it be liquids? No definite rules. So whatever you tolerate best. The problem, although, is if you're going to take enough carbs with liquids only, you're going to, the liquids is going to be too much. So to get to the amount of carbs that you need per hour, your liquid intake is going to be 600, 700 mils per hour. And that can sometimes then put you in a danger of drinking too much in that hour. So that's why we prefer taking a little bit of a solid or a gel, you know, to just to not make that liquid overwhelming. Um, in terms of fluid intake, you drink according to thirst most of the time. Um, and if you then at one stage get nauseous or you feel bloated, then you know, okay, I can skip one or two, you know, off my feedings and catch up later again that I don't have to force all the time. Um, but this is only going to work if you start very soon in your race. And that is why we need to start it in, in training runs as well. Yeah, Nikki, let, let's touch on nausea because that is, for a lot of ultramarathon runners, something that plagues them. And we had a question in, I can't uh, find it right now, but somebody was asking about uh, the, the nausea uh, or the nausea. First of all, what causes nausea when you're running and what can you do to mitigate it? You mentioned slow down on the, the fueling, but obviously we do need fuel, so we still need to get stuff in, but we've got to be sensible. What, what causes nausea when, when we're running and what can we do to stop it? Right, it's actually various hypotheses of what can cause nausea. If you look at the nutrition side of it, if your sugar, blood sugar falls, that can cause your nausea. If you're overhydrated, it can make you feel nauseous as well as dehydration can cause you. So it's it's basically to both sides of the coin. So it's either because we're taking too much or because we're taking too little. And it's very difficult sometimes to determine those numbers. And that is why the regular intake is so important. And then other physiological factors. So there's just there's less blood going to the stomach. And especially that also gets more severe as we dehydrate more. And because there's not blood to the stomach and we're pumping stuff into the stomach all the time, it seems to just stay there. So it's not absorbed into the blood and that can cause the nausea. And just basically the whole mechanism of running where you've got a stomach bouncing up and down um, basically for that long period of time also makes you nauseous. So um, I think the best is the training of the gut is important. Maybe working with different types of carbohydrate sources that you don't gel, 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 that there's a, a you know, solid food maybe come in and a liquid food. It's got different, it's got a fructose and a glucose, it's different sugars. And that usually clears from the stomach a little bit better. And then again, never get to a point where you're in so much trouble that you have to eat. Um, because that then causes you to eat or to drink too much. And that can also then cause the nausea. In terms of trying to delay it, as I said, the regular smaller amounts. And try maybe, I mean, it's going to be a long day out there. And try maybe when you eat solid stuff, where if you have to drink a lot of um, liquid or fuel, to just walk through those areas that you don't put stuff in a stomach that's bouncing up and down because that can also aggravate it. You're not going to walk for three minutes. You're going to eat something that gets in, you know, so just try and make it a little bit slower whilst we're feeding. Um, and then if you're nauseous, stop the feeding and the drinking just for a while. Um, be sure that, yes, you're going to pick it up later again and maybe you, you, you'll you feel better, but you can't just force stuff in all the time because Nikki said every 20 minutes and now we go. Yeah, Nikki, and, and it's it's interesting you, you talk about the tables at Comrades because here's another thing that, uh, and you touched on it, that a lot of people don't realize, particularly the novices, is how many refreshment tables there are at Comrades. I mean, there's 40-odd, you're running 90Ks, which means especially towards the, 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 like the final half of the race, you can almost see the table, the next table from the table you're at. So if on normal sort of races where the tables are maybe three kilometers uh, apart, you're taking maybe a sachet of water or whatever it is and you're drinking it, at Comrades, if you do the same amount at each table, you're going to be drinking a lot more than you would at a, at a normal race. So that's something to, to bear in mind as well. And then Nikki, let's, we are unfortunately running out of time, So, and, and there's some great questions which I want to get to as well. Let's talk about refueling after the run and the importance of, uh, of recovery and, and fuel in that recovery. Yo, Brad, that is huge, especially now in this time where training load is quite, quite high or starting to pick up. Um, and I think also because, remember, we don't, so recovery will depend on rest, 
It will depend on sleep. You know, there's so many modalities that contribute to, to recovery, but not many of us has got you know, is in the position where we can go home and take a power nap and, you know, wake up and go and have a massage and those. So we work, we're working a little bit against time. And that also then obviously tells you that you can't really use all the recovery modalities. But the cornerstone that we can use and very successfully is nutrition. And it is important that you get yourself into a habit of eating or drinking immediately after. If we can do it 30 minutes after, you buy yourself about an eight-hour recovery time. That is huge in terms of you know what we're trying to achieve. Um, so, and as I said before, it's repair, refuel, rehydrate. So make sure there's carbohydrates, make sure there's liquid, make sure there's protein. And I think it, the message is clear all around now that a stereostumpy or flavored milk is ideal for recovery, especially if you have to do it on the run. There's nothing wrong with having egg on toast with a glass of orange juice. If you've got time for that, that's absolutely perfect. But if you don't have time, you don't have to do a lot, but start the recovery. So if you can get that glass of milk in or get a stereo stump in or drinking yogurt or whatever and just start the recovery and once you then settle at work or wherever you then have to settle, you're through all the load shedding and you're safe wherever you need to be, you can sit down and have a nice meal and go through that. Yeah, and Nikki, we spoke about hydrating on race day and, and like the difference between overhydration and underhydration. Let's talk a little bit about the importance of staying hydrated throughout training uh, and, and not just on race day as well. Uh, how important is it and, and what should we be doing? What shouldn't we be doing? It's hugely important, Brad. And as I said, um, I think the first thing that we need to do, because everybody's quite aware that we have to drink throughout training, um, what I find, or what I struggle sometimes with, to get people to training in a hydrated state. So we, you know, we don't drink much in the evening. So we wake up in the morning, don't drink anything, and then go on a run. And then it's going to be hard to try and keep hydration up. So if we can set a goal that we start our training set hydrated, I think that would be already a huge achievement, especially seeing that a lot of people run in the morning. So it's a difficult time to be fully hydrated. Um, drinking on the road, small regular amounts, but also according to thirst. And sometimes it does make sense. Um, to drink your liquid with either electrolyte solution in it or a carb in it, like sports drink, and not all of it as a water intake, because you do retain fluid much better if there's a carbohydrate or glucose in a drink, as well as there's a little bit of salt in it. Not thinking that we must take salt tablets or any of these kind of things, but sometimes a sports drink really helps with hydration in terms of the absorption of the fluid, rather than only having water right throughout. You can measure if you're successful with this in training sets in terms of weight loss or weight gain. So if you gain weight during your run, then you obviously has the fluid intake was too high. And if you've lost weight, it's it's probable that you're going to lose weight. But in looking at the amount of weight we lost, we try not to let that amount exceed about 2 to 3%, especially on the shorter stuff. I mean, on Comrades Day, you probably will lose more fluid than that. But on the shorter stuff, we try to not lose more than 2% of your body weight, and then you know you're okay with hydration. You don't have to then push harder than that. Um, so please take time and go through weighing yourself before and after training and just see what happens to your weight in that training because it will give you a good idea how far or how you're doing with hydration on the run. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Nikki, I mean, we, we've sort of brushed through a lot of the stuff tonight, and I've just been reading the comments in uh, under this broadcast as well. There are some great sort of uh, tips and, and things that work for different people. And if you're struggling to dial in your nutrition strategy, read through those comments because there are some great ideas that might work for you. And now is the time to be trying those things out on your training runs to make sure that come race day, you've got a strategy that works for you. There is no one size fits all. What works for me might not work for Lindsay. What works for Lindsay might not work for you. So uh, that's, I think, probably the biggest takeaway that I want people to get out of tonight. And I'm sure you feel the same is between now and comrades race day is the time to dial this in and experiment and find what works for you uh, and then make sure that you've got everything in place for you on comrades race day we've got some great questions from our international viewers tonight uh, about what's at the tables and that sort of thing i will try and get a list of that from the comrades marathon association uh in the next week or so and pop it onto our website but there is pretty much everything there's coke and there's uh there is 
water and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. There's food, potatoes, bananas, uh, but it varies from table to table. If there are certain things that you use that are specific to you, uh, if you run for a running club in South Africa, most of the running clubs have got tables uh, along the route at various points where you can leave a bag with club mates and pick it up on race day. If your running club doesn't have that, there are services that are provided that way. Uh, or that do that. There's uh, one. There's a company called Con Sports who who do it. Uh, Race Pace Tours do it as well. So this is great for our international visitors. Uh, if you want to use specific gels or specific bars, or if there's specific things you want on race day, you can buy one of those packages, and they're at two or three different spots along the the, the route on race day. You can pop them in that bag, and you can pick it up, uh, and you will be sorted. So uh, if you eat everything and drink everything at the tables on Comrades Race Day, there's so much food and drink you will put on weight on race day it's probably the only ultra marathon in the world that's like a, a buffet over 12 hours it's uh, absolutely crazy i'm going to pop this up as well nikki as always great to have you on i'm going to ask some questions now specific ones from the comments but if people want specific help like i said you are in private practice you do do one-on-one -on -one work as well uh if you would like a specific plan for you then there's nikki's details up on screen you can email her and get in touch and uh yeah you can take it from there so those are the details Details. If you'd like to get in touch with Nikki, let me find out uh, or get a couple of these questions. Uh, Nikki, one had to do with, uh, let me try and find it here quick. It was with MCT oil and I can't find the, the question at the moment. Well, actually, let me ask this one while I'm looking for that question. Uh, this is from Jacques Boschoff. Jacques wants to know, he says, one of the, the race buzzwords has always been carbo loading before a race. Can you expand on that and indicate exactly what it entails? Should I be drastically increasing my carb intake in the days before the race? Is carbo loading still a thing? Thanks, Brad. Yeah, carbo loading is still a thing. But the, the thing, the bigger thing now is you have to be on a high carb diet now. So usually if you're eating enough carbs during your training, just by tapering the training in the last days, those carbs will be stored as a, as a, you know, as a carb tank. So um, in those circumstances, I would just suggest keep on eating the way that you've been eating and just taper your exercise. If he is at the moment not eating enough carbs, so that happens to some people, they're either eating too little because there's no time or whatever, or we're trying to manipulate weight or whatever the reason, then it does make sense to two to three days before the time, start introducing more carbs into your diet. You can either do it through solids or drinking a carb-loading drink, you know, in two or three days leading up to the race. Um, but it does, uh, the main thing is that it does load your tank, that it's a full tank that you start off with. But sometimes the problem with this is, remember, commerce is a very long day. So you don't have a tank that's going to last a day. That's, I mean, we doesn't matter how much you load. It's not going to work. So it will help you on the last few kilometers, but only if you're going to be good on eating on the road as well. So you're not going to load enough to run a comrades with. I think that we must get clear. And if you are somebody that really struggle on the road to eat and drink on the road, I would suggest that you do a little bit of carb loading, but you have to do it in training because sometimes with the increased amount of carbs, people really do feel bloated and you will gain weight. If this is successful carb loading, there is weight gain. Um, otherwise, it's, it, it's not successful. So it's really two or three days beforehand. Either keep it as it is and taper exercise or eat more. If you're currently eating too little, it is not a pasta party the night before, comrades, please. <laughs> Nikki, question from Bonang. Bonang wants to know, what's your take on a plant-based diet in relation to training for comrades? Yeah, you can be – it's all good. You will be able to um, – most of the plant-based diets is in any case much higher in carbs than if you eat meat. So that's maybe a good thing on the one side. There is a few negatives. So remember the protein must be included. So don't go plant-based where you don't eat protein sources like the legumes. That's important. And the other thing that's important um, with um, iron, iron is extremely important because we run as ease at the risk of getting um, or needing a little bit more higher iron content. And if, we only eat plant-based. We usually take the higher or the more available iron out of the body, out of the diet. So it's important that you do, when you go plant-based, do it cleverly so that you do include the protein with regular intervals, enough protein, and that you make sure that you do include iron sources. And that would include something like eating enough spinach, beetroot, raisins. So there is enough iron that we can get through the plant foods. We just need to be clever about it. 
And one thing I want to tell those that's plant-based, you can't be plant-based and fussy. <laughs> you, <laughs> you need to make sure that when you're plant-based, you eat the veggies, you eat a variety of them, and you do eat the legumes. But we can't go plant-based with our vegetables. Those kind of combinations will never work. <laughs> I love that. Okay, then quick finally from Hadman wants to know, what do you think about MCT oils for energy during the run? Okay, MCT oils does give quite a quick burst of energy. Our problem with MCT oils is if you're going to have, if you're only feeding on MCT oils, you're going to need so much that it's going to cause, cause gastric distress. So MCT is renowned, therefore, if we eat a lot of it, it does make your stomach go a little bit wild, and we need a lot of it to, to really fuel. So there's some of the gels on the market that use a mix between the carb and the MCT oil, um, which you can use. Um, the MCT oils will work just because it is a quick release um, of, of energy, where fat usually don't have that property. Again, this one would be very, very important to train with, and to train with it on that distances, um, not to just start taking it over the last, you know, five Ks of my 32. <laughs> That's not going to give you an indication. And this is the only reason why I really, really give you this warning is basically because of the, the effect of MCTs on the, on the gut. So it's going to need training to gut training to, to run with it. All right, perfect. Keep those questions coming. We did start a few minutes late, so apologies for us overrunning tonight. But I did want to share some resources with you uh, tonight just to help you get through. Lindsay did mention it earlier on. Uh, if you're looking for a comrades training or a strength training plan, we've got one free that you can pick up at coachparry.com forward slash strength. It'll take you through to that page. Yeah. Also, be sure to check out our weekly audio podcasts. We do uh, two different podcasts. One is called Run with Coach Parry. Uh, the next one's coming out tomorrow. And then and there's also the Ask Coach Perry podcast as well, which are just short little snippets. We put two of those out a week. So whatever podcast player you listen to your podcast on, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever it is, just search for Coach Perry and you'll find those two podcasts. And also check out our weekly videos that we post onto YouTube. If you go to coachparry.com forward slash YouTube, uh, you'll find them there. We've got one coming out next week, and I saw that question pop up in the forums today. And it's specifically about running, uh, how much mileage you need to be running, uh, what sort of weekly mileage, as well as uh, your times in order to finish, comrades. We're going to be doing one for each of the medals. So next week, Monday, is the Vic Clapham. Make sure you head over to coachparry.com forward slash YouTube so that you don't miss that video. And then also, uh, you can head over to comrades.com. There's a whole bunch of resources there. There's ladies' seminars coming up. Uh, there's these Bo uh, Bonnie Tass Comrades Marathon webinars. And thank you very much to Bonnie Tass for sponsoring them. The next one is happening on Monday, the 9th of March. And we're going to be talking a lot about strength training in that one. Uh, and then also the Comrades Marathon Road Shows. The next one's coming up tomorrow night at the Atlantic Athletic Club in Greenpoint. That's taking place at the Hamilton's Rugby Club. And then next week, Tuesday, the 18th of Feb, it's happening at the uh, University of Pretoria at the Tuckies Marathon Club in Gauteng North and then Lindsay's also doing a Comrades Talk in London so if you are in the UK that one's taking place on the 8th of March 2020 if you'd like to get yourself tickets for that all you need to do is head over to coachparry.com forward slash London that's coachparry forward slash dot com forward slash London all the details are there and then I mentioned Jeffrey a little bit earlier on in the talk as well and hopefully you stuck around to hear uh, a little bit more about Jeffrey's story I mentioned uh, that he made one big decision. And that was in October. He decided to stop listening to all the advice on Facebook and WhatsApp groups and everyone around him. And he decided to sell out and listen to one person. Uh, and what he did was he joined the Coach Parry Training Club just over a year ago, and he's been training consistently. You might remember I said 12 months ago, he ran a marathon PB of 308.38. He's seen some monster improvements over the last year. In September, uh, he ran the Cape Town Marathon in a time of 254.01. So that's at sea level. Uh, he then went back to Johnson Crane uh, just a couple of days ago, and he ran another PB, 253.10, this time at altitude. So he's taken 15 minutes off his marathon time in a year, and he's not going from 450 down to 435. This is a sub-three-hour marathon. It, Jeffrey is in unbelievable shape. Uh, he is heading towards the silver at Comrades, uh, and that is uh, amazing. So 
Uh, yeah, he's not going to be chasing or racing another marathon or ultra before Comrades. Uh, he's on track to take an hour off his Comrades time with that marathon time and to run a silver. Uh, and that's it. If you want to find out more about the Coach Perry Online Training Club, we've got training plans for you. You get direct access to Lindsay and the rest of our coaching staff, as well as Nikki as well. Uh, if you've got any nutrition questions, uh, you get access to the iOS and Android app. So everything is in your pocket. Uh, like I said, Comrades Training Plans, it tells you exactly what pace you should be running all your training runs at so that you run them at the correct paces. You have access to the coaches. You can chat to them daily in the forums if you want. We also have weekly members-only calls like this where you get to chat to the uh, to the coaches, except they're a lot smaller and a lot more intimate, and we can get to everyone's questions. Uh, and also motivation and accountability. There are over 1,000 other runners from around the world using that uh, platform at the moment, and we'd love to have you on. So if you'd like to follow a training plan that's proven, backed by science, and gives you direct access to the expert that wrote it, no more guesswork, no more dodgy advice in Facebook or WhatsApp groups. All you need to do is head over to coachparry.com forward slash roadmap. And we've got a great deal there for you now. If you want to join, uh, it's not too late. You can get onto a Comrades program right now, uh, and it'll take you right through to Comrades Race Day. Lindsay, quick question with regards to the folks training overseas. I just want to find... Uh, this one quickly. Well, Nikki, let me ask you this. This is a great question from Danny. Danny wants to know, what does hydrated mean? Uh, must we simply pee out excess anyway? Uh, how do we avoid being underhydrated? Thanks, Brad. I'm on low battery, so if I disappear, I'm sorry. Um, so being hydrated, you yes, there must be um, a big urine volume, regular, and also it must be quite of a low color. So the underhydration is going to be avoided if you eat, you know, drink small amounts, as I said, with regular intervals. Um, we we just don't want to go in a situation where you take a 500 more bottle and you down it. So it is important. Um, again, I don't, I can't stress enough that the day-to-day -day hydration really is important, and that we tend to only look at the hydration whilst we're running, and we forget the whole of the rest of the day. So. Um, yeah, look at the color of the urine, look at how often you go to the toilet. So we're not supposed to only go to the loo once a day because that will mean that you're not hydrated very well. And then look at the color of the urine is also a very, very good indication. All right, Nikki, I'm going to let you go because I know your battery's about to die. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we look forward to catching up in the in the forums on the Coach Parry app. Uh, Lindsay, question for you from uh, Tafadzwa. Uh, Tafadzwa wants to say, how can I adjust to temperature change? I'm training for comrades in winter in the UK. And, and obviously a lot of our, our international runners are training in, in the Northern Hemisphere. This time of the year is really cold. Is there anything they can do to, to sort of prepare themselves for what's coming on race day temperature-wise? Look, that's a really good question, and it and it is difficult. And often, when um, people from the northern hemisphere ask me to predict their finishing times, um, I'm not nearly as good at it as I am with people training in in hotter climates. So it's it definitely does impact. But um, yeah, there are two things really that can be done. If you can get into a sauna a couple of times a week. Um, Getting into a sauna definitely helps your body to cope better with um, heat stress. Funny enough, it also releases growth hormone, which in turn also helps with recovery. And then the other thing is to do um, um, indoor training, so running on a treadmill uh, with the with the heater on. So um, it's not quite the same, but it does definitely help you to prepare much better. Uh, for the heat, so those are the two the two um, tactics that you can use to help you prepare better for that heat. All right, love it. So just a big thank you once again to Bonnie Tass for making these webinars possible. If I could ask you in the, the comments below the video, let us know what you got out of this. What's the one thing that you're taking out of tonight that you are going to implement in your training over the next four weeks? I also mentioned that the next webinar is happening uh, on Monday, the 9th of March. So make sure you register for that. Get to comrades, uh, get to coachparry.com forward slash webinar. And the replay of this will be available on YouTube, on the Coach Parry YouTube channel tomorrow. So uh, if you've missed anything, if you want to check those slides out in a bit more detail, particularly Nikki's slide, there was lots of info on those. Uh, you can check that replay tomorrow. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Lindsay, parting shot from you before, uh, before we go and uh, head off for the night. Yeah, you've had tons of, of um, nutrition advice, but I think one of the very clear messages that came out for me from that talk was that 
there are definitely aspects to nutrition that are very um, unique to each individual. And the reason why we've had this training, the, the nutrition talk so early is so that you can put some of these things into practice uh, and figure out what works best for you as an individual. So get out there on your long runs, um, get experimenting, see what sort of things you like to eat, things that you look forward to putting in your mouth and make sure that you feel your training and your racing properly. Absolutely. And that's it for tonight. Uh, Lindsay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to, to Nikki uh, for joining us as well. It is hugely, hugely appreciated. Best of luck uh, over the next four weeks. We'll see you on the 9th of March. Uh, and don't forget to check out all those resources that we shared tonight as well. There is absolute gold in there if you're training for comrades. doesn't matter if you're training for your first or your 20th. Uh, there is a ton of information in there that can help you. So thank you very much once again. We look forward to catching up with you again soon. From the three of us, it's cheers.